All right, so in the fourth quarter last night, the Clippers shot nearly 70% against the Lakers. Reggie Jackson got to the rim without much hesitation there. We have Hartenstein up top. They're acting like they're going to do a handoff action for Luke Kennard, which is what LeBron is anticipating. But Hartenstein just keeps going all the way to the rim once again, pretty easy. I'm going to guess that Malik Monk and Wayne Ellington running into each other did not help. Now, they were going to LeBron at center in the beginning of the fourth year, which means that Malik Monk ends up being the guy helping on the roll guy, uh, and, and that's just not going to work. Now, they got back to AD at center, but then they started playing aggressive on screens, which just led to a bunch of open jump shots. One was PG to Reggie Jackson. Here, they go to trap PG as Luke Kennard sets the screen. And then from there, that's just an easy mid-range. Now, this might have been the worst one. For one, this isn't even that strong of a trap on PG. But also, Luke Kennard has free reign to do whatever. He could have got a layup. He runs to the corner as if it's nothing. I mean, that's just routine. Now, sure, they were better on this Morris 3 that banked in, but when you have so many bad possessions in a row, you have one bad break, and that's the game. Now let's talk about the offense. The thing that I'm always looking for is how often is AD involved in an action that's not just a post-up or an isolation, which usually means how many screens is he setting. Because I feel like good things happen whether AD's the one scoring or not. I mean, him simply setting a screen got the swing offense going and he was there to get the lob. Here's an AD screen that gets THT going downhill. He has uh, been a bit of a hot topic amongst Laker fans. Look man, THT likes to shoot. And sometimes that can lead to his first three games of this season where he was great. Or it can lead to this weird thing where they need him to be a role player, but he doesn't really know how to do that or doesn't want to do that. But maybe there can be a middle ground where he can make open shots and bail them out of some possessions that are going nowhere. An example of that being this one where about six seconds left in the shot clock just attacks a closeout off the LeBron pass. Now on to Warriors Suns 2. Steph Curry was picking on a lot of the Suns' little guards. Step back against Cameron Payne. Here he gets the switch onto Landry Shamit from the Draymond screen. Another step back. One more time. Gets the switch onto Landry Shamit. And Shamit, that was very close to being a highlight that Shamit would not have enjoyed. Let's look at this fun Warriors action. So we already had Jordan Poole going around Draymond once. Then it's another handoff action. And then he notices that Crowder is digging in in the paint, which leaves Toscano Anderson just open enough for the three. Looney sets the screen, Shaman and Aiton are all over him, bounce pass to Looney, then gets a handoff to Damian Lee. Little bit of daylight for the pull-up midi. Now with Devin Booker out, Cameron Payne took it upon himself to do more of the scoring for Phoenix. Unfortunately, he missed a lot of shots. The Warriors were clearly comfortable with conceding these shots to Cameron Payne, and they were successful. They did also benefit from him missing a couple of pretty wide open ones. Now on to the Celtics game where, honestly, I'm not even mad at the Celtics for this one. The Jazz shot insanely well on difficult threes. They shot 53% from outside overall. Now, that wasn't the only thing. I mean, for example, on this play here, Mike Conley gets by Richardson with not too much trouble, which forces Neesmith to help, so then Horford has to help on Ingles. But even so... It's a pretty okay closeout, but nothing was working. For this one, Horford is right there on Mike Conley. He was 7 for 7 from outside. And then the one that broke me, this step back from Donovan Mitchell over Horford. Once again, solid contest. Dude, it was the wildest thing. It was like, there's, there's no chance the Celtics win this. I mean, the Celtics offense was good. Tatum was attacking. He had 11 free throw attempts on the game and a really nifty spin move. And also, uh, once Yudoka went to Horford at center whenever Gobert was in the game, it opened up their offense because Gobert had to close out or he couldn't just plant himself in front of the rim all game. I mean, here's an example of that right here, where because Horford is spotting up out here, Gobert's got to pay attention to him. So what happens? The paint's wide open. Now the Rockets have won five games in a row. This is obscene. Let's look at some Shengun type stuff. So... Here we get a really nice spin move against Mo Wagner. Pump fake, one dribble. I mean, Rockets fans have been screaming from their Reddit accounts for Steven Silas to play him more. Pick and pop, love to see it. I mean, the guy can do it all. We saw a post move, we saw a pick and pop, and now here, 
a pump fake, two dribbles, another pump fake, man. But he also had five assists in this one. Here, he's going to find Kenyon Martin Jr. on the short roll. And then something you love to see is right when he gets the ball in the post, he's not looking to score. He's surveying the floor saying, all right, where are my cutters? Where are my open shooters? What's going on? Let's things develop for a second. Finds Eric Gordon on the cut. Now let's talk about the Mavs, who I believe are 2-6 and six in their last eight games and lost to the Pelicans by a pretty decent margin last night. And the easy thing to say is that they just missed their threes. However, they've won games this year where they shot badly from three. They've also lost games where they shot well, so I don't know if it's just that. I mean, in the third quarter last night, the Pelicans did whatever they wanted. Valanchunas makes that over Dwight Powell, who Mavs fans are pretty out on, by the way, at center. Anyway, here, Reggie Bullock just went for the double team on Devontae Graham, leaving Garrett Temple open. That opens up the drive, and then from there, it's just a dump-off pass to Valanchunas. And we'll look at one more. This one's rough because they just don't get back. Now let's talk about Luka for a bit. They're 11-7 and with him, 0-3 without him. His shooting percentages are down across the board, although that's mainly from jump shots. His inside scoring is still amazing. We just had a quote from Jason Kidd the other day talking about how Luka should stop complaining about foul calls and stuff. I'm not really concerned. I mean, obviously, without him, they'd be the worst team in the league, and I think by the end of the season, Luka's numbers will be fine. But still, so far this season, he has not been at his best. 